supports this for a very good cause that I think we can all agree with. So finally, on to tonight's main event. We are joined tonight by our very own Andy Wasang, Communications Manager at BirdLife South Africa, who's going to give us a rundown of the recent African Bird Fair 2022. And he's a relatively new member of the team here at BirdLife, but was thrust into the role of Program Director for our first ever hybrid event. And I'm glad to see that he has come out of the other side mostly unharmed. <laughs> the African Bird Fair is a major event to organize, usually involving a few all-nighters in the lead-up, I should know. And Andy managed this despite having a small human to take care of at home as well. So despite all the challenges that we faced given the pandemic, our first ever hybrid event, etc., etc., the fair was again a huge success. And Andy will tell you a little bit more about it before we screen one of our most popular sessions, the amusing anecdotes from across Africa. This hilarious and entertaining get together features all sorts of funny stories about birds and birding trips, including personal injury, getting lost, car trouble, and of course, some of the very crazy habits that we as birders pick up along the way. So I'm going to invite Andy to turn on his camera and unmute himself. And uh, Andy, the floor is yours from here. I'm very excited to hear your little recap and then to rewatch what was an absolutely side-splitting session uh, between you, Dan, and Sandiswa. Good evening. Thanks so much, Andrew. And good evening to all the, the viewers and the listeners. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on. It's a, as you said, a program of events was jam-packed. So it was very interesting to be thrown in the deep end of the African Bird Fair, which so many people have um, become loyal fans of over the years. Um, I'm sure many of you watching tonight are, have, were attending not your first African Bird Fair or virtual African Bird Fair. And um, yeah, luckily that small human that Andrew referred to, if I keep my fingers crossed under the table here, is, is fast asleep, allowing us to have a, a, a good evening uh, of festivities as we recap a bit of the bird fair and then make our way into our anecdotes um, session. So um, I just need to get the sharing permissions across here from Andrew, if I could bring up my screen. Cool, hope everyone can hear me all right. Um, and yeah, the first thing I wanted to do is just encourage you to use the chat box with us. Um, please feel free to drop your thoughts in the chat uh, as we go along. If you have any questions about the bird fair, I know there's a number of team members on, uh, on the chat who will respond as well. And um, as we make our way into the anecdote session, please um, feel comforted by us all sharing our embarrassing stories. Uh, Andrew mentioned the most embarrassing story of his ornitholo uh, ornithological career. Um, so we're here to share and, uh, and enjoy um, amongst each other, and it's a safe space. So if you would like to share your anecdotes in the chat box as we go along. Um, otherwise, just a brief history of the African Bird Fair. Many of you will know it as the virtual African Bird Fair over the last couple of years. Um, obviously, with COVID, uh, we had to pivot to a digital virtual experience, um, hence the virtual African Bird Fair in 2020 and 2021. But before that, many of you may... Um, may know the African Bird Fair from its days um, in the Walter Sisulu Botanical Gardens. And even before that, um, if, you, if you're one of the staunch African Bird Fair visitors, perhaps before that at the Johannesburg um, Zoo. Um, and many people did ask us, you know, why, um, why did we stick with virtual? Well, coming out of COVID, um, you know, the decisions were only made to really relax those restrictions on physical gatherings once uh, planning was already well underway with the African Bird Fair. Um, but second to that, we found in the previous years that since we pivoted to digital from, for example, the Walter Sisulu Botanical Gardens, uh, National Botanical Gardens, we found that uh, this opened up attendance uh, and engagement and speakers from all over the continent. And of course, it is the African Bird Fair, and we, we are you know, hoping to grow that presence throughout the continent and engage with more colleagues and speakers and birders throughout. But also across the world, we had uh, attendance from Canada, Australia, um, if I'm not mistaken, even the Philippines. So um, yeah, attendees from, from across the world joined for the virtual program. Um, and then of course there was a physical program as well. There was a physical um, an in-person event at Isdal House so that we could test the waters once COVID restrictions were relaxed. Um, Claire Neal, our events manager and our organizing committee at large got very busy trying to organize a, a physical event. So hence the decision to keep it as a hybrid event, uh, which is something we, we'll look at going forward as well. 
purely because it, it opens it up to bird clubs and uh, participants from across the country, the continent and the world. Um, and I would also like to acknowledge our sponsors. We really were very fortunate, um, are very fortunate to have amazing partners and sponsors who, who came on board and really helped make this a, a great success. Um, of course, we had an organizing committee as well behind the scenes, um, which Andrew was also a part of, um, and a huge team behind the scenes bringing this together. But without our sponsors, really, um, it would never have been possible. And as you've probably become aware of through the, the branding, um, Swarovski Optic was our headline sponsor for 2022 and really helped make it an amazing event, including sponsoring a number of initiatives, bringing their, their truck to Isdal House. Um, they offered lens and scope cleaning to um, people with binoculars and scopes on the day, uh, as well as a, a talk from one of their brand ambassadors. Uh, many of you may know Martin Bernardi is also a fanatic um, bird photographer and he leads tours throughout Southern Africa and Africa, birding tours. So we were very lucky to have Martin on the day um, on behalf of Swarovski um, talking about learning to bird or getting into birding uh, for the first time. And he, he covered things like, um, you know, setting up the right equipment and uh, joining a club and getting your first bird book. And of course, starting in your own, your own garden and your own, <clears throat> excuse me, um, your own backyard. Um, so really catering to, to a variety of um, birders. So that was Swarovski, which was our headline sponsor. And as I mentioned, we were very fortunate to have a number of, of sponsors uh, come on board. Uh, our platinum sponsors were the Ford Wildlife Foundation, the Hans Heisen Charitable Trust, and then we had Ital Tile, MSC Cruisers, uh, who many of you um, maybe have become um, familiar with from our, our, flock, our flock events, uh, most recently the Flock to Marion event. And then, of course, uh, Zeiss as well, who also had a stall at the Isdal House um, offering lens cleaning and advice on binoculars and, and their wide range um, from the sort of entry level right up to the, the, the more professional. Um, from a silver sponsor's point of view, we, had, we were lucky to have Leica, Strake Nature, um, both of which were at the at Isdal House as well, um, showcasing some of their books and um, binoculars, etc. as well. Uh, Chamberlain's. Uh, we had Bird Pro, Westerman's, um, the Bird Food and Bird Seed Range, and the John Fulker a Bird Book Fund, um, who are the publishers behind Roberts, uh, as many of you may know already. And then our gold sponsors, of course, Canon, uh, Everard Reed Gallery, Charles Gregg, um, Wild Earth, African Bird Life Magazine, and Exclusive Books. And as I mentioned, they, these weren't just sponsors that, just, you know, that, that we just named because they uh, helped contribute towards the bird fair. But they really did get involved. I mean, um, Canon was, was at Isdal House in the day showcasing a number of uh, different types of equipment as well. Uh, Charles, um, Christopher Gregg from Charles Gregg was there with beautiful bronze uh, statues as well. Um, and then as many of you may have seen, we had a, an awesome partnership with Wild Earth where our community bird guides went off to Juma Game Reserve uh, and had an awesome time with a live birding safari. Um, I see exclusive books there as well. Again, just offering to, um, to help us with the, the Jonathan Franzen interview, which Jenny Cruz Williams and Mark Anderson um, hosted. So all of these sponsors really got, um, got really involved, uh, which was great. And it was a pleasure to work with all of them. Um, I mentioned the physical event. So we had, a, we had about 250 uh, people coming through to Isdal House. The, the, the road, Hume Road was packed with many cars and it was very encouraging to see people coming out and supporting um, our exhibitors and meeting our sponsors and our BirdLife South Africa team. Uh, obviously, after two years of lockdowns and things like that, people were quite hungry to connect in person again. And we had um, some of you may, may know Oliver Matumbo, who's a, an artist down based down in Delta Park in Johannesburg. Um, and he sells bird art and bird paintings. And recently, we actually gifted him some bird books to help him increase his range. And you can see in the picture there, he's He's done a range of African birds quite recently, now that he's gone through his Sassel bird books. Um, in the middle there is Martin Bernardi giving a talk to, to, to kids and adults alike about starting to bird. We had coffee trucks. We had voice rolls, of course, uh, being a Saturday. Um, we had a membership stall and a secondhand book stall. Um, there were several artists on display, um, which we were really lucky to have. And Straight Nature, obviously, selling some of their books as well. Um, some of the bird clubs were on display as well, so people could inquire about becoming a member. Um, Swarovski had a, had a tent and the caravan where they were um, trialing products and cleaning lenses and scopes, as I said, and some more artwork there as well. 
Um, and as I mentioned, Zeiss is very involved as well. And there's another picture of Oliver, who actually had his, his best day in terms of sales at the bird fair, um, compared to what he said was an ordinary month. Um, and there's some of um, the beautiful sculptures from the Charles Gregg um, Gallery. So really nice to connect with everybody and, and, and see everybody at the event. Um, we also had a coloring in competition and these are our two um, winning entries and we've got um, Georgia Blackwell from Pumalanga who won the category um, for seven to 10, if I'm not mistaken. And then we had Luke Broadway who was um, from, who's from the Western Cape and he won the, the categories aged uh, 13. So um, what was nice about this is we had over 100 entries um, from kids across the country and they had to fill in um, some of Fancy Peacock's um, artwork, uh, basically like a stencil outline. And then Fancy uh, gifted these two winners um, Fancy's bird book, so a copy of Fancy's bird book each. So that was also um, very, very popular. And then I mentioned the Wild Earth Partnership. Uh, this was definitely one of our highlights. Um, as many of you know, the Community Bird Guides uh, project and initiative is um, sponsored and supported by Swarovski. And it made sense. Uh, it was just such a natural fit that with Swarovski being our headline sponsor and Wild Earth coming on board as, as broadcast partners, essentially. Um, Paul and Kumani and David Letzualo um, from Hubeskloof and Waterberg. Uh, hopefully many of you have been out with them out in the bush and got some, some of those forests um, and bushveld lifers. And here you can see um, James Hendry. And if you follow Wild Earth, uh, which used to be called Safari Live, you'll be very familiar with James, very, very eccentric host and naturalist. And here he's interviewing Paul and David around the fire. And that was on the Friday, the 22nd, uh, the fireside chat. And it was really an amazing opportunity to get to know David and Paul uh, better if you, if you haven't um, already met them. And these are available online as well. And we can, we can drop links in the chat box towards the end of, the, of this uh, webinar. Um, there's Paul on the, on the back of the, the truck. You can see the equipment in the background. Definitely an interesting take on, on live safaris with this equipment. And there's David in the front chatting to James. And then, of course, a mandatory selfie um, from, the, from the vehicle as well. And what was so interesting is that um, it was just such a nice spin on these live safaris to stop, particularly in the morning, the Saturday morning on the 23rd of July, and to have David and Paul and James and then cameraman and Paul at the back there as well, turn off the engines and just listen to that dawn chorus, um, which was really amazing. We had long-billed crumbecks and bush shrikes and chagras, of course, and um, spur files all waking up in the morning and it was such a great start to the African Bird Fair. And then onto the virtual program, we had a really jam-packed um, program. We were very, very fortunate to have two uh, amazing keynote speakers, which were Jonathan Franzen um, from the US, um, from California. And Jonathan is a, not just one of the world's most well-known novelists at the moment. Um, some of you may be familiar with his novel, Crossroads, um, which is his most recent novel. He's also an award-winning uh, bird conservationist. So he's dedicated much of his life to being out uh, in the field and um, assisting and sponsoring many projects. Um, so he's, he's an award-winning novelist and a best-selling novelist, but also an award-winning conservationist. Um, and Jonathan was, was, was keen to join us, um, was, was happy and we were privileged to host him. Uh, Jenny Chris Williams and Mark Anderson interviewed him live on the Friday night from our, our Canon studio. Uh, and you'll see the Canon Studio in action shortly in the anecdotes session. Um, and then Samuel, Dr. Samuel Deo Osanubi, um, who originates, if I'm not mistaken, from Nigeria, but is certainly a globe-trotting ornithologist uh, by profession. Uh, he's currently based in the Yukon in Canada, but his career has taken him um, from the Fitzpatrick Institute up to the Yukon in Canada and all over Africa. And he gave a really, really interesting talk um, on... Uh, intra-African migration and migrants, especially looking at the Woodlands uh, Kingfisher. Um, so that's, that's something that was, was really a, a highlight for me on the Saturday, was just getting to know that species, a uh, species that many of us know and love, but getting to know it so much better. And then we had uh, three workshops, um, which were hosted by Dr. Melissa Whitecross, so, um, founder and co-host of Conservation Conversations. So you'll all be familiar with Melissa, and she gave an amazing workshop on birding the grasslands. So again, um, an area that we, we so often pass through, and it was just amazing to, to learn so much more about some of those species, um, LBJs especially, that, that frequent the grasslands, 
and how that biome and that's so the ecology of the grassland works to support these species, um, many of which BirdLife South Africa is attempting to protect. Um, we then had uh, Lance Robinson give a talk around bushveld birding and how to ID some of those trickier um, and more common uh, bushveld birds. And then Dr. Aldo Baruti, uh, formerly of BirdLife South Africa, who um, gave a very popular talk on um, birding in your garden and how to, attract, um, how to attract birds to your garden with particular plants, water, and types of food, um, et cetera. And that was also, also quite popular, especially with people just looking to get into birding um, a little bit more. And then we had a number of other talks, uh, the anecdote session just being one on a Friday evening, but we were really spoiled for choice. We had country, country features um, from Mozambique, um, Gabon, um, and Kenya. And we also had a species focus um, on ground hornbills of, of Africa and several, several others. And then BirdLife South Africa also had an opportunity to showcase a lot of our work through our conservation division, um, the Mastery Marion project and, and several others. And we also had uh, Kariuki and Danganga from BirdLife Africa talking about the challenges of um, conserving birds in Africa across, across the continent. And, and he's um, from the BirdLife Africa partnership or BirdLife International. Um, Africa Secretariat. So yeah, a very spoiled for choice. It was a jam-packed um, program virtually. And as Andrew has mentioned, much of it is online uh, on our YouTube channel. So we'll drop the links in the chat as well here. And we suggest you go and, and take your time and go through some of that content. And um, there's, there's so much on offer that we don't want you to rush through it. And of course, this evening is just, um, just one of those. So as I mentioned, before we get into the anecdote session, we wanted to ask if you are willing and open to sharing some of your uh, entertaining, or potentially embarrassing, or, or sometimes painful, and, and as you'll find out shortly, even life-threatening <laughs> anecdotes of your own. Um, please do share them with us in the chat box. Uh, we'll be more than happy to, to chat about them afterwards. And as you'll see, it's definitely a safe space once you hear uh, Daniel, Sandiso, and I uh, sharing a number of, of stories from ourselves, but also many from the birding community as well. So without any further ado, we shall get into. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the African Bird Fair. It's Friday night, and uh, I'm here with Dan and Sandiswa, our, uh, our guests and fellow birders uh, who are going to be entertaining us with some anecdotes um, from across Africa when it comes to birding. I know that uh, many viewers with us tonight will have stories uh, when it comes to expeditions that they've been on, whether it's up nearby in the Kruger Park or further afield uh, in the continent, or just in your in your backyard, you know, uh, walking into big game while twitching a certain lifer, um, or basically Dan stepping foot in the sewerage works, as some of you may identify with. So we just wanted to welcome you and yeah, ease into this African bird fair this Friday evening and uh, have a bit of a self-deprecating laugh at ourselves as, as birders. So yeah, welcome Sandiswa and Dan, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, oh, thank you, Andy. It's wonderful to be here tonight. So guys, we all as birders have uh, one of these stories, if not many more. I know Sandiswa has some hilarious, but also painful stories. Yes. Um, <laughs> tell, us, tell us your thoughts on, um, on I, some of those. I, th I think the main thing is that we all have fallen somewhere. Uh, even if it, you didn't injure yourself but some of us have re-injured like for me i used to play soccer <laughs> and so i got kicked on the knee i had to stop soccer and then i forget about it until winter time and that reminds me when i have to crawl through some thicket or wherever because mm. i remember the first time i photographed um uh what is this thing an african goshawk um, it was late at work. I wasn't supposed to be at work at that time, but because I saw a bird that looked like one of the birds that was poaching the chickens at home, I was like, ah, it can't be. And the last time I ran away because the chicken was chasing me for saving the chicks from the goshawk. So this time around, I was like, ah, I need to capture this, only to find out that I'm going to re-injure my knee trying to get the picture because it was dark. I was not supposed to be at work. I was triggering alarms that were not supposed to be triggered. Oh my, <laughs> my boss knew that the alarms were triggered. He didn't know what was happening. So they found out via the security cameras that I was at work after I was searching for birds. So the knee was not the biggest problem. The boss finding out I was at work after hours was 
a bit of a thing to explain. I'm like, oh, ah, boss, goodness. maybe going forward, you'll Sounds find, like <laughs> you'll Sounds find, like <laughs> you'll find some images. Unless yeah. you're a bird who actually understands that that's the truthful ex um, explanation. You know, I think, I think the fact that the bird flew into a place with the cameras pointing at it saved me. I may have been jobless before I actually got jobless, but it was nice that the guy was also, um, into nature and conservation so he didn't mind that i was there but i don't think he actually liked the fact that campus security had to come through and check what was going on at work <laughs> oh so the injury wasn't a big problem the fact that campus security came in and had to check the cameras Explaining that. Is, uh, did you get the bird the yes end? i did <laughs> yes i did i didn't know what it was because someone i put it online actually on bird life and someone asked her son who works at kruger to ID it for me. And since then I've been forgotten how an African Gossok looks. So I'm happy about that as well. So that's one of the most amazing things though about the birding community is the network that we've now created through social media and various other mm. platforms. Mm. That to take a photo like that of an African Gossok, a bird you may not necessarily know what it is, and to share it so widely mm. within seconds minutes you've got yeah. a positive identification on it. It's just it's an uh, incredible sort of element of this hobby yes. that we all share but your photography has also taken you to some interesting places i remember you telling me a story about photographing a sweet wax bowl that uh, saw you stuck in a thicket door. yes no actually i got stuck in a stream that isn't too, too deep but for me because i can't swim i don't do large bottles of water like bigger than a bathtub so anything bigger than that is so now i see this bird it's fluttering around but it lands on a reed across the stream and in there we had venus fly traps we had um the the the, the what are those the lotus uh, flowers yeah. now you're not supposed to go in there without a wader on i didn't realize how deep it was until i had to walk in in white sneakers oh my goodness <laughs> for the bird Luckily, it was a, not a common wax bill, it was a sweet. Yeah. But trying to get to it, I had to get over my fear of water, which wasn't yeah. a lot. Because when I tell people, they're like, ah, maybe you would have learned to swim. But like the water was knee deep. Yeah. But for me, that was it's the still biggest. intimidating, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. And you, especially when you don't realize that it's that deep. Yeah. Because for me, it was like, ah, ankle deep, I can do it. Absolutely. Next thing I know, I'm knee deep in water yes. and there's algae and there's, <laughs> now I don't want to break the lotuses. It was a whole lot so of you things. you learned how to swim for the sweet. <laughs> <laughs> I learned how to wait for this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not... Dan, that, that, that reminds me as well. Of, I think you might have a story uh, similarly about not quite missing your white sneakers, but uh, tell us about that uh, fluff tail. Yes. So, <laughs> for a very long time, buff spotted fluff tail was one of my most wanted birds. Okay. Fluff tails, obviously, understandably sought after. They're all impossible to see. And it was one big birding day. I think friends of mine will. Uh, recall this as well. One big birding day, we heard this buff spotted fluff tail calling. And this is a bird that had eluded me for years preceding this. But it was on the opposite side of a small stream that was flowing out of the Belmont Valley Sewerage Works just near Gramstown. Well, birders being birders, this isn't <laughs> going to stop us. And we traipsed <laughs> through the stream in pursuit of the buff spotted fluff tail. Needless to say, we did not see the buff spotted fluff tail. Oh, wow. um, but we got home that afternoon and there was a bucket full of jick waiting for us. <laughs> and we were instructed to jick ourselves down before we were allowed anywhere near the driveway. <laughs> so it's, Bench. yeah. It seems we all have a bit of a muddy stories that so those of you um who've done some birding in botswana i have heard of lake ngami now lake ngami goes way back to pre-david livingston days but it's supposedly one of his big finds and it's on this ancient map of botswana as this great lake mm. um and it's just south of maun in bots and um the big big waters of the okavango i think it was something like 2004 um came down for the first time in 20 years the biggest water in 20 years and so there was word going around um, bots that Lake Ngami had water in it for the first time in 20 years. So we head down there um, and nobody knows about Lake Ngami. We literally asked all the locals. We'd heard from someone, I think Map Ives is a, is a very well-known um, ecologist in Berlin, in Botswana, that you need to drive X Ks past this town, mm. get to the village. And then um, in Botswana, people signpost a lot of turnoffs with things like um, car doors. Yes. So like the semi-rusted yes. turquoise car yeah. door, hit a left, go down the dirt track, and then the dirt road um, forks and keep left kind of thing. <laughs> so anyway, as we're driving, 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 ask the locals, nobody knows. 
about Lake and Grammy. And there we are in my dad's beaten out old uh, cruiser. And because the water rises, it comes so slowly, it lifts the, the, the soil and oh, the sand. And, and you can't actually see the water that well. Anyways, we end up in the middle of this lake. The water's around us, but yes. we don't know. Uh, it turned out we got stuck overnight had to sleep in the car um, in this great lake. Oh my goodness. Livingston's great lake. But <laughs> here's the flip side. We woke up the next morning it seems we weren't the only visitors to Lake Ngami. The sky was black with Red Bull Quilias oh, in there. Wow. Millions. Wow. And I mean, literally on, on par with the great migrations of the Serengeti and things oh, like that. Wow. It was incredible. So yeah, we get stuck in the mud, but we, we get just rewards sometimes. Absolutely. I've got a similar story to that. We, um, a few years back, were up in Zambia and I managed to persuade my parents and my partner to go after the African pitta with me, which is everyone will know the African pitta is this mythical, incredibly sought after, but strikingly beautiful bird. But in order to see the species, you've got to wake up at well before dawn. Yes. It's a long drive to get up to the site. I am most certainly not a morning person. <laughs> so waking up at half past two in the morning to go after a bird is already a challenge for me. <laughs> My family are incredibly grumpy at this stage that we're going after some bird. They've got to wake up at goodness knows what time of morning to go and see it. Anyway, the birds tend to display as soon as the summer rains start. And this particular year, the summer rains started in full force. So the drive to get to the particular site where these pitters were displaying involved several stream crossings that ultimately became river crossings and what should have been a fairly simple experience going out and seeing these pitters turned into a bit of a mammoth adventure ultimately we got there at about 10 o'clock in the morning and since 2 a.m since 2 a.m <laughs> wow at this point everyone is very grumpy with me is it was this worth it was it worth chasing these pitters down it took us a while and ultimately we did get a pitter up in the tree and it was doing its little butterfly display mm. all and all of that and it was just one of those things yeah. to see non-birders so completely engrossed by the sighting to see them so sort of fixated on this bird was just such a special experience as well that came from something so uh trying to get there i think it also plays into that thing of as much as we birders understand it when you get another person who's not into birding to enjoy it as much as you absolutely is that thing that says yeah. now you know how crazy i am it's, it's a life-changing hobby in the sense that you can go to kruger and on a standard day in kruger in the skakuza area to see the big five isn't a particularly difficult task mm. sure the rhinos and the it's... leopards may be a bit more challenging but on a standard day in kruger you can go for a drive you can see 60 80 100 different bird mm. species yeah. and most people in the park just drive past it. You definitely pull up next to you and say, and I've had it on countless experiences. You um you parked on the side of the road with a beautiful carmine beat or something next to the car. A vehicle will pull up next to you. What are you looking at? <laughs> oh, no, it's a, it's it's a bird. <laughs> Why are you looking at them? And they sort of storm yes. leaving you in yes. a cloud of dust. But as soon as you get involved in it as soon as the bug bites it becomes just absolutely yeah. contagious Definitely. And you can't, so there's so no talking, cure talking about kruger i think that's um, a good motivation for these stickers that we all know and see and i break for birds being one yes. of the absolutely uh, i know bird life uh, south africa actually stocks them in, in the store and I, what i love about it is if you put that badge of honor on the back of your car the amount of vehicles as you've said that do zip on past without stopping to ask and i was recently in the kruger sitting uh, at a leopard sighting uh, right next to the road and the car sort of you know how you like idle up you see if you can see anything that the other cars see yeah. and if you don't see it immediately something big and hairy yes. in the bush um the fact that you got the i break for bird sticker the assumption is that okay this guy's looking at an lbj yeah actually i was sitting with the leopard right I've, next to i've it. had exactly oh, the wow. same experience where you're sitting exactly as you say you're sitting there the car pulls up next to you what are they what are you looking at and you hear the the wife and the passenger seat or whatever it is say um oh no look they've got the the birding sticker they're looking at birds and they storm <laughs> off and there you've they've got a beautiful out. leopard sighting yeah. or something next to you speaking or of that sorry sorry to, to, to interrupt you when i was working at mountain zebra yep. 
Um, sorry, Granny again. <laughs> <laughs> Some story she doesn't know. Um, I almost got attacked by a lion. Oh my goodness! Because you know the 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 the, the buckets that we used were were ten colored. Yeah. So now I didn't know why there were so many cars parked there, but I knew it was something to do with game. I'm like, okay, cool. What are they looking at? We need to pass. We have to check the fence and whatnot. So we couldn't pass because there's like a gazillion cars parked there. And I didn't realize that there was a lion feeding. So now there's like bikies the same size everywhere. And I'm sticking out because I was standing at the back of the bike. And because the lion saw this one thing standing with all this uniform cars parked there, it thought I was actually coming for the kill. Mm. So it came zooming in and I was frozen in, in the same spot that everyone had to hoot or whatever they were doing. I can't even remember. And the drivers were like, student, pass in through the window. <laughs> and trying to pass in through the window, there was a secretary bird flying the other side. So I don't even realize whether they were looking at the lion or the bird because there were people with the stickers that says, I break for birds. But at the same time, people were looking at the lion. I didn't even realize that it was there until it flew off. When I asked people what was going on, they're like, oh yeah, we're looking at the bird. Thank you for showing us the lion. <laughs> I'm like, guys, I could have died. They're like, yeah, we get it. But next time, don't stand like that. Guess what? I stood like that for the rest of the year. But the fact that people were actually looking at the bird and I almost died helping them find the lion yeah. <laughs> was one of those things where I was like, I'm not telling Granny this because if I don't die here now, <laughs> she's going to find a way to kill me for trying to kill myself. <laughs> Sorry, Granny, wild. if you're listening. I, <laughs> I love you. <laughs> but I think we've all got that story where we've sort of put ourselves at a little bit of personal yeah. jeopardy yes. in pursuit of a bird either going somewhere we maybe shouldn't have mm. reminds me of a story from um uh, an english chap by the name of chris goody okay um some of the listeners may know him as the jewel hunter he is one of the few people who managed to see each and every single species of pitta in a single calendar year and again to draw back to the african pitta he described his experience walking through these dry riverbeds looking for African pitters in the southern parts of Zambia and noting fresh elephant tracks or leopard mm. tracks in the riverbed where he's walking up and down in pure darkness without torchlight. Um, I've had a personal experience looking for green breasted pitter in Uganda, where again, it's pre dawn, you've got to get into the forest an hour before sunrise mm. while the birds, uh, when the birds start displaying. And we were charging through this forest full of chimpanzees, for forest elephants, giant forest hogs, you name it in there. And the local armed guard we were with just suddenly screamed, turn around and run. So now you're running through this forest in pure darkness. You have no <laughs> idea where you're going. You're tripping over vines. And there was a forest elephant with a calf about 10 meters above Ooh. the, or ahead of us in the trail. And she charged us. Luckily, it was a mock charge. But I mean, I think we've all been there with yes. birding where you sort of almost die. Almost die. <laughs> yeah. All in pursuit of some random little bird that most people in this world will never have heard of. At all. And sometimes you don't even get the bird. Yeah. That's the funny <laughs> part is that you almost die, but you don't get the picture. But that's the fun of it is the the going out and actively looking for, for it. For danger and as well. Sometimes you <laughs> see it, sometimes you don't. And it's the experience. That's the of, fun part of that's it. That's the fun part yeah. of it. Yeah. So speaking about near-death experiences, um, many of the viewers have actually sent in, we asked uh, viewers to, to contribute to the session this evening um, so that we don't just dominate the mic. <laughs> um, and there's some very, some good ones that come through. And the one I actually want to start with comes from one of our countries, probably arguably one of the best storytellers, uh, former editor of Getaway Magazine, David Brister. Um, and he's, he's happy for me to name him on the story, but he was basically up uh, in the Zambezi shooting a cover story for, for Getaway. Um, the aim was to get the Batoka Gorge with, with the rainbow. Mm. Um, and they were also looking for African finfoot. And so they were out um, basically around these islands with his lens in front of him in a canoe. And as you know, canoeing on the Zambezi can be quite interesting, looking for finfoot in the sort of the fringes of these islands. And uh, I'm going to let David describe it, but he basically says, there was a huge explosive sound behind him and suddenly they were floating uh, airborne it was the strangest feeling and we were flying through the air and landed with a big splash uh, so david if you're listening i hope we're doing justice to your near-death experience I hope obviously it was not an african finfoot yeah. 
It was uh, a hippopotamus. Oh, wow. I hope the lens survived the trip. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I think so. Um, anyways, they hit the water and he said, his guide said, hippo, swim for it as fast as you can, but don't splash. So, I mean, you know, in the near-death experience, and apparently you must not yeah. swim in a frantic state. And don't splash. Glide. Don't run when the lion charges you. And you run. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the long and the short of it is that, um, thankfully, the hippo didn't chase after them, but it did, uh, it did bellow at them as they got out the water at the island. Um, and he was also saying this was the days of film before digital cameras. So his film and his lenses were in the canoe with him, and the, this hippo almost flipped the canoe. So the film obviously went flying and floating down the great mighty Zambezi, and his spools were obviously in the bag. Thankfully, his um, those waterproof cases. Okay. Um, he went trawling the river's edge the next day, I think, and managed to find enough spools, uh, some surviving spools. Okay. And because they were in their plastic case, uh, some of them survived, and his pictures were were protected. And one of the, the covers of Getaway Magazine was actually from that expedition. Oh wow! From oh, wow. The, the top of Gorge. So that it made it onto the front cover. So that was uh, it was worth it. That's incredible. <laughs> it was worth it. Yeah. I almost died, but I got it. Oh my yeah, goodness! Exactly, got the shot. <laughs> and for a bird like a fin foot as well. Exactly. <laughs> I feel like I got the shot as a dangerous um, yeah. precedent. Absolutely. Yeah, Dan. I know you said you also had some interesting um, inbound tourists in some of your further field Africa expeditions. Look, I think there's a certain description that can characterize most birders. I don't think it's necessarily true to, well, I think it's true to all birders, essentially, that we've all got our standard khaki attire that we go into. <laughs> and I always think it's funny going into an airport where, it, particularly in a place like Madagascar or somewhere that's renowned for birding groups coming through, and you can spot the birders from a mile away. I mean, I do it. We all do it. You're in your standard khakis because, of course, you've got to be camouflaged. Yeah, the the straps, you've course. got your binocular straps when you're going onto the plane, and the airport security is giving yeah, you a, a look, look. From, the, uh, from the side windows what are the to, to make sure. Absolutely. But also, what are they spying with their binoculars? Yes. Little do they know it's the little wagtail on the runway, not where the planes are parking or whatever. <laughs> you also have to tuck your socks in, or sorry, the bottom of your trousers into your socks, mm -hmm. which is a fine fashion choice. I mean, Amazing. fashion Par uh, Paris Fashion Week, we're coming for two you. Turn. Yep, two turn. <laughs> um, but all in case you get the chiggers or the uh, pepper ticks, leeches, whatever it is, you've then got to have your floppy hat. Definitely I mean, you can't have floppy. a cap because we were talking about this uh, just before the session that um, a peak cap is one of the the worst inventions for birders. That Learned that the you pick way. up your binoculars <laughs> and your cap falls off. Yes. So there's the standard look that defines us. And to everyone else, I think it's utterly ridiculous. But I think that's why they call us the crazy ones. Because only we are proud of looking like that because we know why we look like that. But it's also the behavioral elements that come with it. I mean, how many times have you... Uh, you, me, any of us been leopard crawling after some bird to count. You, in the camps in Kruger and you're leopard crawling after <laughs> some hornbill and there's a lady sitting on the table next to you feeding it her slup chips because yes. <laughs> but you want that perfect eye level shot and so you've got to get down on your belly in the dirt. And having to explain why you're doing that to a non-birder without sounding like you need to be put in a mental asylum. No, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I think that's uh, one of the beauties of a, a session like this is we amongst friends and uh, <laughs> just to go back to some of those friends who have submitted um, embarrassing and many life-threatening experiences um, so Gisela Ortner, who many of you will know from helping organize Flock to Marion, um, was also in the Kruger Park. Seems that there's many near-death experiences <laughs> in the Kruger Park and looking at saddle-built stalks in the riverbed. So thanks, Gizzy, for this, this story. And I'm sure many of you can identify with these other near-death encounters. And um, while they had their binoculars to their eyes, you know, you forget that you've now got blinkers on for the rest of the bush felt around you. Just to clarify, they were at... Um, at one of those alight spots in Kruger where you can safely get out of your vehicle. Okay. But um, it took the vehicle behind them to, to idle up and basically say, you guys need to get back in your car. There's six lines, um, six lines just meters behind you. Um, oh my goodness. That said, apparently it still took some convincing because they were like, we're birding, we're fine. Um, <laughs> so a good advert for, for, for birders Absolutely. there. Yes. And um, okay. also, also in Kruger, we've got Jean Thomas. Um, 
who speaking like about in the camp and people yeah. watching you. So she was sitting outside her chalet and just watching someone set up their braai. And it was obviously um, summer and migrant season. And he had the meat on the braai and laid out his table and everything. And uh, she says that he went into a chalet to get salt um, and a, a kite. Obviously, kites are quite well known yes. for um, stealing your lunch at picnic sites mm. and, and camps. Um, basically grabbed his meat from the grill and the guy came out looking bewildered and, and um, couldn't figure out where his what meat had gone. <laughs> what and he looked across at her and basically, as if to say, you stole my did meat. you <laughs> see what happened? Um, just crazy. They're in the camp. How many stories oh like goodness. this there are? Yeah. Yeah. We had that on the beach at Cape Vidal last year, but we were also sort of sunbathing mm. on the beach, laying sort of um, belly down on the beach, sun tanning not realizing that all of our snacks on the basket <laughs> next to us were being picked off one by one by the, the uh, kites coming down. Yeah. I think we all have that story where you it's it's you can't believe it until you have like a footage of it. Absolutely. Because now the guy I'm sure was looking at her like, really, a kite? Do you think that I'm that stupid? Yeah. But at the same time, if someone had caught that on camera, they'd be like, that actually happened to me. Yeah. So I think it's one of those things where it's too true to be believable, but at the same time, you just have to believe it because birds are birds. Yeah, but birding's one of us, one of those incredible hobbies as well. That every time you go out, it can be a species that yeah. you've seen time and time again. Yes. Every time you see it, it's doing something different, and that's part of the joy of it. Yes. I can't understand how anyone would ever get bored of birding, going out and sort of having these new behavioral experiences mm. or seeing birds do something unique. And as you say, so often you kick yourself because you'll be having yeah. a quick bathroom stop in the bush and that rare bird that you've traveled so far to see pops out in front of you and your camera, your binoculars, everything you. is back in the car. <laughs> it, it happens time and time Always. again. Yeah, yeah, I think it goes back to that thing of birds that you see all the time. For example, I see the hoopoes all the time yeah. in summer. And if you could go through my gallery, all 2011 of my memory cards, there's a hoopoe somewhere there. <laughs> and it's because one day they're doing something else. Yeah. I don't know they could sunbathe because now I saw them lying with their back and their wings are open and they're just facing the sun. And I was like, what is going on? Like, why? But I don't have the camera. Yeah. Now, when I explain it to someone, they're like, no, you're lying. But then at the same time, I see it with the crust up because the chickens are feeding close by. Yeah. And I remember I posted it on, on the bird life group. I saw one in our crawl and then the, because we don't have goats anymore. So it's just there for the chickens to, they, to lay mm -hmm. their eggs or if we have a ceremony at home. So I can go in there because it's family. So I, I was chasing the chickens and then I'm like, okay, cool. And then I see a hoopoe, I run back to the house. I'm like, okay, cool. I hope when I come back, I don't skate away or the chickens are skated mm -hmm. away. I come back, I'm like, oh, it's still there. I leopard crawled our fence line <laughs> so that I could get close enough. And I think I was like a meter away from it. And the crest was up because it saw me. But when I stood up, I was like knee deep in chicken poo. <laughs> <laughs> and I, when I posted the picture there, I was like, do I tell people or do I show them? that I was actually knee deep in chicken poo. And it's not just the nice one that's cute. It was the stanchy one that sticks to your oh, body. No. And when my granny saw that, she's like, I keep on telling you these birds of yours are going to get you into trouble. <laughs> but it's nice because now I have a story to tell and the picture, I got it. I was about to say, but the question is, <laughs> yeah. did I you got, get the shot? I, I got the picture, but at the end of the day, my granny was like, I know you love my chickens, yeah. but I don't think you love them that much because now I had laundry to do because of chickens and the birds, but I just I got <laughs> yeah, the picture. Yeah. You got the picture. I got it was the picture. Worth <laughs> it. You got the shot and all is forgiven. Yeah. It's all worth it. It's all worth it. I'm going to quickly go across to um, Andy Featherston from Bits you know, a bit sorry, but uh, the Protestant Bird Club, and just speaking about birds' behavior and um, and behaving badly. Um, Andy says a couple of years ago, I had to travel to Cape Town on business, and after I finished my meeting, I had a bit of spare time. And as we do when we have finished a meeting early, of course, you pop out and yes. get a couple of extra hours. Absolutely. You have to in dance case <laughs> at the sewage works. Yeah. Um, so I went off to Cape Point Nature Reserve. And he says, it was a, a blustery day, so I parked my, my hire car in an open area where I could watch the occasional T-square, so white chin petrol. Um, and he was so engrossed in the birding uh, and startled when his passenger door opens. Again, you know, those blinkers on with your binoculars yes. are dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so much so that passenger door opened and somebody got in. So he just assumed he was going to be held up. I know that Cape Point area can be dangerous. Oh. Um, 
and something would be stolen or the car would be taken. So he turns, he says, to face this intruder and came face to face with the biggest, hairiest, and ugliest, I think you've guessed it by now, male baboon Baboon. he's ever seen. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It gets even better. He says, he quite calmly sat there as if waiting for a ride and looking looking at me as if to say, okay, where are we going? He then helped himself to a chocolate bar. Of course. And a half finished (laughs) bottle of Coke. Of course. (laughs) And eventually a nearby taxi driver came to Andy's uh, rescue and basically tried to shout and uh, chase off um, handsome Harry, as he calls him. <laughs> and he says between him and the taxi driver, the baboons, because the taxi driver pulled up next to Andy, but on the baboon side. Yeah. So now where do you think the baboon's going to escape? Yes. Got to go through Andy. the driver's door. <laughs> so he just said, um, his only escape was through me. So I quickly opened my door and bailed out to be swiftly followed by my hairy friend. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this hairy friend was last seen <laughs> running for the fame boss. With the the and, the <laughs> <laughs> and the chocolate pursued by a couple oh, of car oh <laughs> So yeah, please, if you're watching, watch and petrols and Cape uh, Point. Cape Point, please Make sure. be very careful. <laughs> Lock your doors. And then um, <laughs> another one from this time from a bird life South Africa colleague, Alan Lee. Uh, he was so busy looking for button quails um, up in the Bavians Club. Yeah. He called the story Bavians Button Quails and Buffalo, and you can just Ooh. guess how it ends. Ah. And he had his binoculars uh looking for this these button quails was doing a survey out in the field and by wandering out uh into the into the reserve away from the cottage where they were staying counting button quails he didn't realize that between him and the cottage which is now 100 meters three uh, dugger boys had, had moved <laughs> in um, and he basically just said that two of them moved off mm. after a long stare down but the one wouldn't let him there's wouldn't always let that him one pass. yeah there's always that one dugger boy just gives you that look yes he's got some fantastic photos again um photos seem to be what everyone's after uh, so it can definitely get you in a bit of trouble this yes. birding thing yeah. Yeah. yes it can and it's so much fun when you talk about it but during that whole course you're like ish is this how i die like really is this Absolutely. what they're gonna write die trying to put it with a bird <laughs> At the risk of making the session too much about primates, one of my <laughs> <laughs> one of my other favorite birding memories was again the same trip uh, to Uganda where we were in Kabali Forest where we got charged by that forest elephant. Mm. Later that afternoon, we were out looking at for chimpanzees and we were um, exploring the section along the main road. Now they have a species of baboon there called the olive baboon, which is a much gentler species. Um, it's largely herbivorous, but it is somewhat more intimidating than the chakma baboon that we get here in South Africa, and that they've got which this. Which says a lot. Yeah, they've <laughs> got this large know. sort of lion-like mane, which makes the males look especially intimidating. Mm. Anyway, as I mentioned, they're largely herbivorous. Now, in um, Uganda, the staple food is bananas yes. or plantains. So down the road came this truck covered in bananas on the back i mean bunches and bunches of bananas and it seems to be a trick that these baboons have learned that the entire troop sits in the middle of the road so the truck has to slow down enough that the scouts can jump onto the back teamwork and here these baboons were tossing as many bananas (laughs) off the back of this truck again it's one of those experiences that you wish you had a camera because no one would ever believe you These baboons were tossing as many bananas off the back of the truck as possible. As the truck then started to accelerate, you see this sort of panic set into the baboon's eyes that does he keep tossing more and more bananas off or is it time to now jump? (laughs) Jump And reach the point where all these baboons sort of lurch themselves off into the roadside bushes and then they all sort of scurry down to enjoy the feast. But one of those experiences where you just have to I mean, you need you a to camera to, to document it. Oh. Just mm-hmm. incredible. So bringing it back to, to South Africa from the deep forests of, of Uganda, many of you will know uh, Lance Robinson, and he's actually giving a, a workshop on Saturday um, on bushfelt birding. Um, so this one, at least not as life-threatening as some of the others. I think that's a good, healthy direction <laughs> that we're getting ourselves yeah. into here. Um, and he says, a, a group of birding friends and I made a, a special detour to the Agatha plantation near Zanin, which many of you will be familiar with. Uh, this was to get his first bat hawk. Mm. Um, and you would have seen that the bat hawk is obviously a very elusive species. Mm. I know it features in the latest African bird life magazine. 
Um, so they were given a general GPS location, which as you know, can be problematic uh, yeah, on its yeah. own. And um, yeah, on, on route to, to Bloberg Nature Reserve, we arrived naturally excited, coupled with nervous apprehension that a prospective lifer obviously gives, as we know. Parked in front, um, we parked and spent the next few hours walking up and down the sand road, scanning the trees keenly for this well-known pair of, of bat hawks at the exact pin location, obviously. Um, but our time was limited and it was getting unseasonally hot. Eventually, we could no longer spend any time looking for this bat hawk. And so we reluctantly trudged back to the vehicle in order to get going, which we know is very demoralizing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But there, right above our vehicle, sat our bat hawk, maybe only two meters. It had been there the entire time. Oh, wow. my goodness. And it reminds me, Sandisa and I were talking earlier, forget, um, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think you said one of your lifers that you're after is this Narina. And ah, um, Sandisa was, so was hating me earlier because <laughs> I lived in Barberton for a few years and they pretty much Narina, yeah. Narina trogans everywhere. Um, and a friend and I casually came back from, from like a game of squash or something in the morning and drove up our driveway. And I'm not kidding, this driveway was like this ridiculous angle. And so the car used to make such a noise getting up the driveway, yes. it would screech its way up. But despite this, we drove up and we're about to get out of the car and sitting in the open, completely uncharacteristically, is this supposedly Just shy chilling. Narina Trogan, like literally above our windscreen. Mm. We sat in the car quietly and watched it for two, three minutes, right in front of us, didn't turn its back on us like this. So That's often amazing. Do. Um, so yeah, yeah. Like bat hawks and the that's, dragons. That's a bird that so many people struggle with. I remember my life in arena trogan. It's one of those memories that sort of it's these few birds that for life you'll remember your first ever sighting of that. Mm. And arena trogan was one such species for me. So it was a similar experience there. I had spent hours trudging through this riverine forest up in Zambia mm. looking for my life in Arena Trogan. I must have been 10 at the time. And eventually, exhausted, dehydrated, I give up. No, I'm not seeing it today. <laughs> As usual. Let's go. Home. <laughs> so I go back to the main homestead, and my dad came and picked me up about 10 minutes later, and we start driving out. I'm saying, oh, Dad, I'm so disappointed. I didn't get to see my Narina Trogan. You know how long I've been looking for this bird. And as we come and cross a bridge, my dad says, oh, there's there one. Is. And he, oh. he stops the car and literally right next to the car in plain sight was this Narina Trogan. And you were just, there almost dying. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think that's the same with me with the Southern Ground Hornbill. Because yeah. the first time I saw it, I had the camera, but it was inside my bag mm. in a taxi. So I made a sound like, <laughs> so everyone thought I was dying. They're like, what is going on? Like, do you need water? But yeah. in the taxi, I'm like, no, a bird. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. They drive off. Imagine my heartbreak yeah. when we go back again. It's not there. Oh no. So I saw it. I was happy. But because I'd been wanting to take a picture of it, because the first time I ever saw it, it was at a distance. I thought it was a Hadida, Hadada, yeah. <laughs> our conversation earlier on. <laughs> and I'm like, that looks like a black bird, but I don't know what it is. And my problem was trying to get to it. And then when I ran to it, it flew past me, landed on our roof, like my house, on the roof after I left my house trying to catch it. So I had to come back to my house, it was gone. Like each time I wanted to picture it, something gets in the way, but I had to run and my knees still wonky, but yeah. I still ran. But now I don't have that thing of, I got the picture. So I'm hoping eventually when I do get a picture, I'm going to share it with everyone and be like, guys, you have remember, to. Absolutely. remember our conversation. Yeah. I got the picture. <laughs> <laughs> but you also mentioned when we were speaking earlier, just before the session, mm. that uh, recently you came across Grey Crown Crane and it was a similar experience where Ugh. the sudden gasp let yes. forced the taxi to stop and you piled out with your camera to photograph I did. It. I did. And when I spoke to them and they're like, what bird is that? I was like, ah, a, a gray crown crane, but like, what is that? I'm like, yeah, they're like, oh, that's how it looks. Yeah. But they didn't understand my, my joy. But when I saw it again with a fellow birder, he stopped. I almost crashed into the window screen, <laughs> but I understood because I've been there before. And yeah. it's so much nicer when you get people who actually share the same thing. And even if we almost die together, it's the thing of, ah, remember yeah. that fun part Absolutely. because everyone understands where we're coming from. Yeah. But it's, it's always nice to have people who share the same values and they don't almost die because you all almost die. So it's I mean, that thing. <laughs> I think we've all been in the car with a birder who's driving at one point or another where 
something flies over and you inevitably <laughs> driving and suddenly you're off the road you follow and the it's bird. <laughs> quick swerve yeah. back onto the road <laughs> this is very relevant i mean just a few months back we've had all this water at, um out towards the vol area mm. the vol dam uh, so my wife and i were driving and i'm definitely going to place the blame on, on her for this one <laughs> um, and i've obviously been a, a birder for, for much longer and she's sort of getting into it through me but often you know teases me yes um so i was so i was so chuffed that she took interest on this particular occasion because i'm sure as many you know viewers or, or listeners will, will know sometimes you like the birder and you're trying to get that person who's with yes. you in the car yes. to come with you and on this journey so um we're driving along this fall road and then you know out of nowhere i see what still sometimes wonder was a juvenile african fish eagle but turned out to be an osprey so obviously i'm like stop 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 like like you yes. said in the taxi <laughs> and she pulls off onto the side of the road I'm like please just reverse and go onto the side of the road before it flies away and you know how it is it's yes. utter panic yes. um, and obviously they, they are around in that area but they're very uncommon and uh, so I, I pull my binoculars out and I'm way too busy identifying this juvenile fish eagle slash osprey. And she reverses into not a pothole, like a manhole. And half the car <laughs> sinks into this manhole. It took us a while to push to push out. But I mean, at the end of the day, I was still encouraged that my wife actually agreed to reverse and go did. back to this <laughs> osprey site. But it did cause a bit of damage yeah. to the car. I'm sure there's many people who can identify Absolutely. with it. But you got the sighting. Yeah. But I got the sighting. <laughs> did you get the shot? I, did not get the shot. <laughs> I took a mental picture. Yeah. You see, it lasts forever. Absolutely. Now I can't prove it was an osprey. But getting <laughs> stuck seems to be a common thread as well. So yes. last uh, a few years back, um, I was guiding at the time the world's number one lister he had seen over nine thousand seven hundred bird species in the world so no pressure so mm. no pressure at all and we were on one of the comores islands going after anjuan skopsau which is a bird that was believed extinct for many years yeah. it's it's a black skopsau that's beautiful um but inexplicably rare they um only a few hundred individuals only found within a few fragmented mm. forest patches and we had a single opportunity to try for the species it had rained all day the previous day so our first opportunity was washed out hence leaving just this one evening yeah. to try so we driving up again terrible roads it took us forever to get to the spot for the scops out and we landed up getting stuck but down to the axle stuck what but now having a client like this particular gentleman who so it's down to individual birds to get him over he was aiming for that mm. uh, that magical ten thousand birds mark wow and so for him every single species counts well the local guide and myself have never dug a car out of the bag <laughs> so far you gotta get that paycheck thankfully it was a, a little toyota corolla but still the amount of that that we had to move to get that car out and thankfully we did see the house okay so, good right, okay. you got yeah, that we and we got the shot <laughs> Jeez. happy client yeah yes. happy client so we're gonna go off land uh, just a little bit and um i reached out to some of our fellow bird life south africa colleagues and I, thanks so much to everyone who you sent through um, and speaking about lifers um, many of you watching probably would have been on flock to marion or would have heard of flock to marion and isabel human our hr manager um speaking about lifers on flock to marion was just saying that um she's a little bit embarrassed to share this because you know as many of us when you're a new birder and you don't have a particular name or you say the wrong thing around yes. other birds it's quite intimidating and eh? birders can be quite intimidating mm -hmm. and uh, isabel basically says um, she was so excited to be on this, this flock to Marion trip. And it was that day, uh, Albatross Thursday, when we were near Marion Island, and it was just an incredible sight. Uh, and she was so excited and made her way to the front of the boat when she wasn't on shift at the, the very busy um, Q&A desk or the front info desk. So she said it was very crowded. I managed to find a spot right at the back, uh, but I could climb <laughs> up a pipe contraption, which I'm pretty sure is against the rules of the NSC <laughs> orchestra, um, which allowed me to look over most of the crowd and get get visibility to what was happening in the front of the boat. The atmosphere was electric, which I can definitely attest to. <laughs> the excitement fueled by constant loud calls from the guides. Everybody was frantically trying to get on to whatever sightings had been called. A variety of albatrosses, petrels, etc., and then penguins. And there were so many penguin species out there but in the Southern Ocean that were new to many of us. One of these, for Isabel, was a macaroni penguin with those yellow um, yeah, tufts, yeah. Yeah. So Isabel was very hyped up and she went after her sighting down to the desk for her next shift. 
And um, Mark Anderson, the bird life South Africa CEO, asked to, you know, what, um, what did you see? Have you, have you been birding and have you managed to get out there? And very proudly, she rambled off a few petrels and albatrosses and then told Mark that she had seen a spaghetti penguin. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we can all um, identify with those moments. So thanks, thanks Isabel. Um, and then, yeah, back to the, the theme of injuries. Uh, I know many of my colleagues out in the field doing, doing research yeah. and um, conservation work have been injured by some species. And I know Ernst Retief, for example, sent through um, a story about being kicked by a secretary bird, oh. which could be quite painful, I imagine. Yes. Uh, reason Yangera also on Bird Island, it's known that the African penguins can be a little bit aggressive Vicious. and uh, I think he took a, took a knock from a penguin as well. <laughs> but I want to use this opportunity to play a couple of voice notes. So some people sent through voice notes and we're very grateful for you sharing such stories that, that make you look um, compromised. Um, so the first one we want to play is actually from, from Andrew de Bloch, um, who is the AV tourism project manager at, at BirdLife South Africa. And it also speaks to being injured while out uh, researching. So my fun anecdote uh, and an embarrassing one at that goes back to my days as the resident penguinologist at BirdLife South Africa before my days uh, working as an AV tourism project manager and I was running a research project where we were putting little GPS backpacks on penguins to see where their most important fishing grounds were. Um, so this process first requires uh, catching the penguin which is a process on its own where you are lying front uh, down, groping around in a deep burrow, uh, generally with your uh, front covered um, in uh, what used to be fish after <laughs> before it had gone through a penguin's gut, um, and grabbing these penguins and shame, yanking them out of their burrows, and we do a little bit of processing before we do the GPS uh, uh, installation, if you can call it that and one of those involves weighing the penguins um, so the way you weigh penguins is you tie a little belt around uh, underneath their flippers and you use like a fishing scale you know if you pick up a fish on a scale and, and it has, sort of hangs in the air and tells you how how heavy it is it's the same thing for penguins um, and when you pick up a penguin at uh, it uh, with that scale and throw it into the air it's literally the first flight a penguin has ever been on so they're very very confused and they look around and they're a little bit bewildered and then um, when you have your weights and you've written it in your notebook you need to bring the penguin safely back under control because there's a very sharp pointy end which can do some damage and the way you do that is you grip the penguin behind the head um, so you can control that pointy end now I was dealing with a particularly uh, hmm, aggressive and and a ferocious male penguin which was a, a big one at about 4.8 kilos and uh, as I went to grab behind the uh, penguin um, around his head to control his uh, pointy end, I happened to miss because he was wriggling about and I gripped down on the neck, which meant that the head still had a full range of, range of movement. And uh, that pointy end was aimed at the closest part of me, which um, happened to be my chest. And I was wearing a t-shirt and the penguin managed to rip right through the t-shirt and uh, <laughs> there's no other way to put it other than it ended up piercing my nipple <laughs> and uh, there was blood running down my front and uh, i had to get the bird under control again under a lot of duress and personal pain but um yeah that's the story of how a penguin pierced my nipple <laughs> and the penguin will never be the same again <laughs> That's one way to get a piercing though. Oh. But I think we've all been there, particularly, I mean, I may be a bit biased as a seabird researcher, but um, when I was doing my PhD on red-footed boobies, I was also, it was my first week out in the field, very excited mm. to be working on this cool bird, and handled a few confidently, and then went to grab one, but didn't quite get the technique right. I was still sort of quite new to the business and learning about it. and. Red-footed boobies have strongly serrated uh, bills. Yes. And it grabbed the fleshy part between my thumb and my index finger oh. and just pulled back. And it just created this two perfect incisions on either oh side. Word. Needless to say, I needed to have stitches. I lost of dexterity course. in my hand for the next couple of days. It's 
working on birds is no uh it's not as fun as no we make simple it to task be. it's <laughs> yeah it took one for the team definitely Absolutely. hard at work doing yeah. conservation <laughs> Um, so another one we've got in is from uh, Dr. Melissa Whitecross, who many of you will know is one of the hosts of Conservation Conversations. Um, and yeah, talks about, um, again, GPS uh, coordinates gone, gone wrong. Um, I definitely think one needs to recognize the incredible talent that Google Maps has for getting birders lost, <laughs> particularly in the northern Zululand region. I was out uh, birding with a few mates in Isimangaliso and we decided to head over to Ndumo for the honorary rangers weekend there. And uh, dear Google decided that the very dry Pongola River at the time the map was constructed looked like a road and took us through several little villages on jeep tracks until we ended up through this milli field and on the banks of the beautiful full flowing pongola river looking at the indumo fence this impenetrable boundary needless to say we had to backtrack and eventually find our way to the main entrance but uh, i think there will be many a birder out there with a tail linked to google maps and uh, their ability to take us to places we probably never should have been the positive note was that when we got down to that uh, end point we saw a red-chested cuckoo which happened to be a year bird so every mishap has a silver lining or a golden tick i guess oh my goodness i think we've all imagine. been there as well getting lost on imagine out birding or on tour or whatever it might be yeah i got lost and i almost walked into a spider web oh because I was running away from mice. I'm not a big fan of rodents. Like, even snakes. I need to know a snake is there. Yeah. Then I'm cool. Mm. But if it just sneaks up on me. So I'm very skittish when I hear something crawling. So because I was avoiding that, I almost walked face first into a garden of spider Ooh. web. And it's massive. And those are nasty there. And it's massive yeah. and it's everywhere. And I, <sighs> I don't like spiders. Like, yeah. I don't mind them. But because of that, I still have... Yeah. heebie-jeebies <laughs> and that's because i was running away from mice i got lost i didn't know which direction to go but at the end of the day i got the picture of the garden of spider oh got it again yes <laughs> sometimes it's nice to just yeah. be lost in the yes. you know like and um, game drives as you said are just not the same when you're just seeking the big five mm. and one example you know just to bring it back to breaking for birds and encouraging you know those who are watching to slow down and just take easy and notice the smaller things we were driving uh, just south of satara and, um, you know, I always have this debate about which is the most accurate bird. I don't know if you guys have some thoughts on this when it comes to alarm calling. Um, so I often like to slow down for those Franklins, but so often mm. it's a false alarm. Squirrels, also false alarm mm. often. And then you get more into like the starlings, which I found to be a little bit more accurate when yeah. there's an alarm call. Like, um, for example, a, a water monitor mm. raiding a nest. Um, and then I was driving down in these these um gray go away birds were going really crazy on top of this tree and i was like okay there's something happening here and we came to just a slow crawl and it was through thick bush mm. and um you just saw these spots moving and again uncommon sightings it wasn't a leopard it wasn't a cheetah it was a serval cat oh, wow. and oh, wow. it was hunting and it was like hunting and pouncing and hunting and pouncing and because the bush was so thick we kept losing it yes and we literally carried on driving and followed these lures and the um, go away birds and they were going from tree to tree on top of the tree as they do yes. and they're such it was such a good marker for where the serval cat was so i mean i don't know if you've had any similar exchanges with a bird that's um, been a marker for something else it's actually been a marker for itself and i didn't know that what it was um that new man helped me with that because me and bird calls are not best friends but i just heard something every every five meters i would hear something going crazy but i didn't realize that i was the the the, 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 the predator that was actually chasing away these birds i'm like i want to see what bird it is and i couldn't for the life of me for a good 30 minutes find these birds until i stopped trying to follow the sound when i turned around it was a white broad sparrow weaver and it was a lifer for me on that oh, day wow. because i didn't know what it was and until I, I recorded it i was in the middle of nowhere and even if i actually injured myself i wouldn't yeah. have found any help but because i was following these birds and my knee was still wonky it has just rained it was the same day i actually saw the barn swallows for the first time so i got two lifers on that day but i wasn't even looking for the white broad sparrow mm -hmm. weavers i was just following a sound that kept on going crazy every time i moved and when I stopped actually chasing the sound, I turned around, boom, it was there. Yeah. 
So it's one of those things where even if you don't pay attention to where you're going, something will call your attention. Absolutely. Next thing you know, a lifer. Yeah. Absolutely. I find bird song just absolutely incredible. And um, a friend of mine, a well-renowned bird in South Africa, many of uh, the listeners may know him, Rick Nuttall, has started birding a lot by sound mm. and actively going out and recording different sounds, recording different uh, species mm. calling and how different different birds in different parts of the country yes. sound completely different. Um, and that's been taken one step further. And a chap by the name of Derek Solomon near Kruger has now actually been doing sound safaris where he takes blind people on mm. safari. They can't necessarily see the birds, but he, with a directional parabolic dish, he records the sounds, wow. plays it through earphones yeah. for uh, these blind people to listen to. And then he has the running commentary that goes uh, with it. With I it. think that's just an incredible extension yeah. of birding and our sort of observationary uh, hobby that we have. Mm. I think it, it puts in you know into context some of these stories. Some of them are painful. Some of them are hilarious. And whether it's the deep forests of Uganda yeah. um, or the islands of Marion and you know into Kruger Park, mm -hmm. you've all got these these stories. And Absolutely. at the end of the day, it's um, for me, birds are like just a a huge part of the environment. It's a way of appreciating the environment and slowing down for a bird call and yeah. seeing something like a serval hunting. Jeez. Um, yeah, it's just a it's just a fantastic way to appreciate nature. Yeah um yeah and be absolutely. in touch with it without even realizing you were not in touch with it yeah 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 absolutely so i think that uh we need to wrap up there are tons of stories we could probably go on all night and i'm sorry for those we didn't get to we, we still have more that, that are coming in right now yeah um and what we plan to do is to showcase some of these stories after the african bird fair perhaps in a conservation conversations uh, webinar episode That'll so, be great. Yeah, yeah, you can also catch Dan um, giving a couple of talks at Kenya. Yes, so I'm doing two talks at the Bird Fair this year, one on birds and big game for Kenya, and the other is about tropical seabirds, some of the work that I've been doing on tropical seabirds, but also just a general in introduction to the birds of the Indian Ocean. Fantastic. And Sandiswa is in conversation with renowned media personality um, Jenny Cruz Williams yes. uh, on Saturday as well. So yeah, please look out for that to catch more from Sandiso and Dan. And yeah, I just wanted to thank you guys for sharing some of these stories um, together and making everybody feel better about their own embarrassing Definitely. moments. Yeah. And yeah, continue to enjoy the, the rest of the African Bird Fair. Yep. And uh, we look forward to do the interview, Exclusive Books interview with Jonathan Franzen, also by Jenny Cruz-Williams and uh, BirdLife CEO Mark Anderson. So catch that coming up shortly. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you thank so you for much, having us. Thank you, Sandiso. Thank you. It's a pleasure. All right, so that was our anecdotes uh, from across Africa session that we played at the African Bird Fair. Uh, just a thank you to Andy for chairing that session and collecting all those anecdotes and uh, putting together what I think was just a hilarious session. And I'm so embarrassed to have that go out in, in public, not once, but twice. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, we all have these funny stories that uh, we as birders collect along the way. And I think that's what part part of what makes the, the journey as a birder so special and, and fun and interesting. And you never know what's going to happen. It's these twists and turns that really help to keep everything exciting. Um, and on top of that, just a uh, massive thank you, Andy, as well, for your leadership with the African Bird Fair 2022. It was a hell of a, an ask of you coming in fresh to the organization and not having the institutional knowledge and the history, but uh, I think we pulled up for another fantastic event. So I'm glad that we got to replay that event uh, for that session, at least for those people who couldn't make it at the Bird Fair. Uh, and I think everyone appreciated it. And yeah, we have quite a few stories shared in the chat box if you want to maybe get stuck into some of those, Andy, and give people an idea of what we might like to do with some of these stories in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much um, for having me. And uh, as I said in the chat box, I le definitely learned from the best. Um, uh, those of you who don't know, Andrew Andrew has been um, mostly, most of the program was, was put together by him and um, the directing of the program, both this year and in previous years. So I certainly learned, um, learned from the best. 
Um, I just wanted to mention and give everyone one last chance to embarrass themselves in the chat box with any, um, any anecdotes or stories. And as Andrew mentioned, there, there are intentions for us to collect these um, and put some together and recount them, uh, recount them in the future. Um, I know that there is some good ones that have come in, uh, for example, Cassia Gallagher, which you wouldn't have seen on Facebook Live, uh, talking about fly fishing in Leidenberg with a, a non-birder friend of hers, who no doubt after this sighting probably became a bit of a birder. Um, they were busy fly fishing and he kept saying that he was seeing uh, a red-footed duck or uh, something, something like resembled a duck with red feet. And uh, when someone else came to join him next to the river, uh, turned out it was actually an African finfoot. So they managed to get a few of their, their friends together and actually see it. And for her personally, um, it was a lifer. Uh, I also see that uh, Christina is still, still connected from Infanta down, down in the Cape. Um, and she was talking about um, her Google Maps failure as well. But um, very fateful, as, as with Melissa's story, that she then um, ended up connecting with one of BirdLife South Africa's community bird guides, uh, Tembo Tembu, And she actually went out birding with him as a result of getting stuck and having to spend the day while the car was being fixed and then crossed the 400 mark uh, on her South African list, I think somewhere between Pinda and, um, and St. Lucia. So yeah, those are just some of the, the stories that have, have come in. And as I mentioned, if you want, you're welcome to send them um, after this, you can email me at um, andy.wasung at birdlife.org.za. And um, yeah, we'll keep it confidential between us and then um, have plans to, to use it in the future. So thanks so much. Perfect. Yeah, so I think there was a, a wonderful showcase of, of just what makes birding so unique. Um, we were also having chats outside before recording that session and just sharing stories about some of the funny habits that we have, you know, we can be having conversation among birders and you will stop absolutely mid sentence and look up and be like black headed heron and everyone looks and everyone just resumes from that exact spot in the same sentence, like absolutely nothing happened. And if you, you're having a conversation with a non birder, people just don't understand it's these, these funny little quirks in that that we pick up along the way. So yeah, it'd be great to collect some more of these stories uh, from across South Africa and Africa. And we have some ideas of potentially re releasing some of them in uh, a sort of uh, anthology of anecdotes, uh, not, not necessarily in book form, maybe in sort of podcast form or something like that. Uh, we, we're tinkering with some fun names for that as well. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, of course, we do have another webinar next week. Uh, next week, we're talking about raptor rehabilitation and how that plays a role in uh, bird of prey conservation. I quite literally on Sunday spent a few hours at the Dahlstrom Birds of Prey Center where at least one of our speakers that I'm familiar with um, is coming from and they do some fantastic work working with injured and, and rehabilitated birds as well as educating the public about the importance of birds of prey. Um, and a really great setup there. So I'm excited to see what they have to say on our, uh, our next webinar next week. Andy, were there any other stories that you wanted to pick up on or um, are you happy to tie things up there? I think, I think just one or two. Um, I know many, many of our viewers are probably, um, are, are, have probably not necessarily seen a, a bearded vulture. Obviously you have to get up to some parts of the berg to be so lucky. So I just thought with International Vulture Day coming up on the 3rd of September, so the first Saturday in September is International Vulture Awareness Day. And obviously the bearded vulture is regionally critically endangered, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so a very special sighting that Henny Fisser had when he, he went up to the Northern Drakensberg and spent hours up at a vulture restaurant, um, as they call them. And um, it was heavy, heavily foggy, so he had no luck with a bearded vulture on day one. And on day two, an um, advertising crew f f um, joined him in the hide and they spent the whole day waiting for this fog to lift. Um, and eventually he got, after seven hours, he says, waiting for his first bearded vulture sighting, he got a few seconds as it soared straight over him, which is quite incredible. Um, so myself, I haven't um, had a chance to see a bearded vulture. I s saw what I suspected was one way, way up high from the Camburg, but just uh, not enough to, to really... Um, confirm the ID. So that just shows um, when you're patient as Henny was for seven, seven hours, you might be lucky to get a few seconds. And uh, I know Andrew had a similar experience in, in Kirstenbosch with a fluff tail. So yeah, 
patience definitely pays off for birders. Yeah, it's funny how things happen. Sometimes you know a bird is there or in the vicinity and you just, you've just got to wait it out and your patience eventually pays off, which makes that reward oh so much sweeter. Um, I shared the story of me sitting in one spot just rooted to um, the top of a sort of sawn off uh, tree stump at the riverside in Kirstenbosch, just waiting for a buff spotted flufftail to cross the river. And I think anyone else sitting nearly five hours in the same spot, watching a little 30 centimeter wide rivulet uh, <laughs> would think you're absolutely crazy. But for birders, you know, it's just so worth it for those once in a lifetime moments with special birds. And then yeah, a couple of people sharing stories about the serendipitous side of birding where you aren't even ready to see something and you just <laughs> stumble upon it or it comes to you, whether it's a pearls fishing out at the dinner table or an arena trogon in the forest just flying across your path as you start your hike or whatever. It's, <laughs> it's, it's funny and, and this is what keeps us uh, hooked on, on birding, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think we, we can't all be as lucky as uh, Eleanor Mary, as you'll see. Um, you mentioned this, this pal sitting not just one evening above her dinner table. Uh, she was already lucky enough to go uh, on a birding trip with Ken Newman. Um, and then on top of that, had a pals fishing house sitting above their dinner table for three nights in a row. And then just decided to add a touch of magic and go and catch a fish from the water right in front of their, their it's what sounds like a bush dinner um, in Okavango. So yeah, Eleanor Mary, thanks for sharing those, those stories and um, definitely lucky charm. Better go birding with you next time. <laughs> well, I think that's a really lovely note to just wrap things up. Again, thank you, Andy, for your involvement in the bird fair and making it the success it was, and also for chairing that session and just sharing with us tonight uh, about the bird fair and uh, these very, very funny anecdotes that we all get to share and, and bond over as birders. And, and um, I don't know whether it's celebrate together or commiserate together, depending on the story. Um, yeah, just thank you so much. And uh, we're really looking forward to next week's webinar as well with the Raptor Rehabilitation. Any parting shots from you, Andy, before we close out? Uh, I think just to uh, stay patient and uh, as we've seen, the, the reward pays off. There we go. Well